Well, good morning. If you're visiting with us uh, for the first time, or a second time, or a third time, uh, welcome. Uh, we're in the midst of a pretty lengthy series, or at least for a few months, little books, big messages, and we're going through uh, various little books in the Old Testament, so prophetic books. And um, we are in Zephaniah this morning, Zephaniah chapter 2. And again, if you're new here, you know, our goal is to do what we call expositional preaching. We try to take the main point of the passage and then let that be the main force, or the main impression of the sermon as well. So that's the goal. Let's look at Zephaniah chapter 2. We'll read it together and then we'll pray. So Zephaniah prophesies here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Gather together, yes, gather, O shameless nation, before the decree takes effect, before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord, of the Lord. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. For Gaza shall be deserted, and Ashkelon shall become a desolation. Ashdod's people shall be driven out at noon, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to you, inhabitants of the seacoast, you nation of the Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. And I will destroy you until no inhabitant is left. And you, O seacoast, shall be pastures with meadows for shepherds and folds for flocks. The seacoast shall become the possession of the remnant of the house of Judah, on which they shall graze, and on the houses of Ashkelon they shall lie down at evening. For the Lord their God will be mindful of them and restore their fortunes. I have heard the taunts of Moab and the revilings of the Ammonites, how they have taunted my people and made boasts against their territory. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord of hosts, The God of Israel, Moab, shall become like Sodom, and the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a land possessed by nettles and salt pits and a waste forever. The remnant of my people shall plunder them, and the survivors of my nation shall possess them. This shall be their lot in return for their pride, because they taunted and boasted against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be awesome against them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth, and to him shall bow down, each in its place, all the lands of the nations. You also, O Cushites, shall be slain by my sword, and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, and he will make Nineveh a desolation, a dry waste like the desert, herds shall lie down in her midst, all kinds of beasts. Even the owl and the hedgehog shall lodge in her capitals. A voice shall hoot in the window. Devastation will be on the threshold, for her cedar work will be laid bare. This is the exultant city that lived securely, that said in her heart, I am, and there is no one else. What a desolation she has become. A lair for wild beasts. Everyone who passes by her hisses and shakes his fist. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord. The only true and living God. 
how we do pray now that you would make this book, this word in Zephaniah 2 to live in us. How desperately we need your help. We need more than the sound of the voice of a mere man. We, each one of us, need to be taught by God in our hearts. And so please come and give us the help, the influence, the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask this for the glory of Christ. Amen. So there's an old hymn. It's so old that I don't remember the title of it. It talks about Christian ministry, or maybe even just the, the Christian experience, Christian life as a sorrow full of joy. A sorrow full of joy. And when I read Zephaniah in the context of Josiah's Reformation, I can't help but experience the very same thing. I find myself asking the question, do I cry tears of joy or do I cry tears of sorrow? And I think the answer is yes. We're to be doing both of those things. Every true child and minister of God rejoices. There is a remnant of grace, as we read in the passage. So we rejoice, only also to weep. Oh, that all the people that we fought the people of God. We're truly the people of God. Oh, that they would stay and not stray and then continue on in their lives, straying away. After a few years of ministry just outside of Boston, we had great cause for rejoicing. My wife and I and our church there at the time, we saw our very first converts to Christ. We baptized them, we received them, we loved them, we cared for them pastorally. There was so much joy in the Lord because of them. But then, so much grief and so many tears as within the year, maybe even within six months, we watched them walk away from Jesus with defiance. A matter of gospel ethics proved to be a cross that they were completely unwilling to bear. And no matter our pleas to repent, however earnest they were, however multiple they were, they just would not return to Jesus. So they denied the gospel, they gave the lie to their profession, and then they went on to return to the world. And just breaks the heart. Which is a breaking I imagine Zephaniah knew all too well. Zephaniah ministers, he serves when the word has been recovered in the land. There's a pious king, Josiah, on the throne. The winds of reformation are sweeping through the nation. Worship is being righted. Lives are being revived. Souls are being raised from the dead. What a time to be alive as a minister of the gospel. Or so it would seem. But sadly, the harvest would soon spoil and the consequences will be devastating. Uh, friends, I want you to hear this morning that the destiny of this world being sealed as it is under the wrath of God, it is salvation critical that you belong really, truly, authentically to the people of another world. You say, I'm a Christian this morning. I've professed faith in Christ. I have a profession, praise God. But do you know what a Christian then does? Do you know what distinguishes their lives as people of God, as followers of Jesus Christ? Do you know what preserves them and polishes them while they're in this world, making their way through this world to that next world, that eternal world, the city of God? Let's come to our text. And consider first the ungodly world and the Lord's certain woes, which we see throughout verses 4 to 15. 
And I think it's best we start with the simple fact that outside of Jesus, outside of Christ, the judgment of God is going to be universal. Starting in verse 4, Zephaniah moves from, you see there, Gaza to Ashkelon to Ashdod's people to Ekron to the seacoast to Canaan's people, the Philistines, the Moabites, the Ammonites, to the Cushites and the Assyrians. And in all of that, we're not to forget the people of God, quote unquote, in Judah. But the force of this sweeping denunciation of a handful of nations and cities and peoples is that all people, all people, no matter our ethnicity or our popularity or our obscurity or our religiosity or our military or our decency or our felicity or our power or our wealth or our pity or our pride, we're all sinners. We're a world of sinners with nowhere in the world to hide from the accountability and the fiery justice of God. It's all very Romans chapter 3, or at least the, the devastating part of it. How being judged to the standard, not of your neighbor's righteousness, but being judged to the standard of God's righteousness Every one of our self-justifying mouths are going to be stopped. They're going to be silenced. We're going to see the reality of our sinfulness and our unworthiness of being in the glorious presence of God forever. We're going to be stripped of our ignorance and we're going to be silenced. As the whole world is held accountable to God. Judgment is going to be universal. Because... It's universally merited. But as we go to Amplify there, just a word with you, friend. You may have noted into verse 9, there will be some who survive the bill that's coming due from God. But if you think, if you think that you can come up with a sufficient payment, if you think you're going to survive the day of the Lord by any other means than by becoming a true part of his people through faith in Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen Lord himself, you are gravely and eternally mistaken. You don't think, for instance, that Ashdod's people or Canaan's people or the Ninevites had their own peculiar ideas about judgment and how to be saved from it? You don't think that in this melting pot that we call the United States of America, there isn't a plurality of truth-despising notions about how things are going to go with you and me when we inevitably leave this world? Well, this is what my culture taught me. Well, this is what my history taught me. This is what my family taught me. Well, this is what my parents taught me. This is what my church taught me. But friend, if what you have been taught is not repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and peace with God and life everlasting, you must be born again. As Jesus says, you must be born again, never minding a single ounce of whatever your pedigree is. There is one God over all the world, and that one God has given one way for all the world of sinners to survive him. More on that momentarily. But let's come back to this idea of universal judgment being universally merited. And maybe you're thinking, now listen, why and how can that be? What have I possibly done to deserve a divine wrath without end? I grant I've, I've made a few mistakes here and there, but this all seems rather exaggerated, doesn't it? And the response is yes, insofar as we morally relativize the glory of God and the evil of sin. 
just in Zephaniah so far. We could spend time pointing out specific sins, plural sins, idolatry in the place of true worship, tasting so much of God and just spitting it back out. We don't like it. Lives lived as if there is no God at all. Complacency, spiritually speaking. Having our heavens here, got my big house, got my nice car. Having our heavens here, which are no heavens at all. Owning no mind nor any thanks to the grace of God and taunting all of those who really do. We can just pile that up. Sin has a million forms. But underneath it all, it has one dominant principle. Zephaniah gives it a word in verse 10, and he gives it a voice in verse 15. And again, you'll note he speaks of it with respect to different peoples because it's a universal principle, a universal imprisonment, whatever its specific expressions in our lives. It's the pride. That's the word. It's the pride in verse 10 that speaks. You see in verse 15, here are the words. I am. And there is no one else. When I lived in uh, Louisville, the patriots of the city had a saying, keep Louisville weird. Strange, right? Keep Louisville weird. That's what they wanted to define their city. That's what Louisvillians wanted to be known for. The other day, we're going to, uh, to Easley, and I grew up like right outside of Easley. I had never noticed this before, but the sign on 123, just as you go into Easley there, it says, um, pride, our pride shows. Our pride shows. Isn't that wild? I just thought, perfect. Perfect for right now. (laughs) This is how the whole of the unbelieving world would be known. It's keep the world prideful. Keep the world godless. Or keep humanity playing God. I am and there is no one else. I wonder if you're familiar with that kind of messaging. It actually comes from Exodus chapter 3, except there in Exodus 3, its original is on the lips of God as he reveals himself to Moses. You may remember this episode of the burning bush. The Lord reveals himself there to Moses as I am who I am, and so on. And it's God telling us he is the only true and living God in existence. He's the only one who's self-sufficient, self-defining, eternally unchangeable God. There is no other. He's it. And so we're all beholden to him. But that truth has had a challenger. That's in Genesis chapter 3. Our first human parents, Adam and Eve, didn't just commit sins in that awful spot of time. Something far more deadly happened there. A demonic principle called sin. It was sins. But sin took the reins of their hearts. And at its center, this lie that, if we're being honest, we all know only too well. You can be God. Now, just like God, you can be God. So forget God. You are, and there is no one else. We bought it. Hook, line, and sinker. That's why God comes back in the next book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 3 again, and leads with this. I am. (laughs) Because he had to. Because sin had taught us otherwise, and because we cannot be saved while believing the lie that continues to enslave every single human heart outside of Christ this very hour. And so you see, friends, our native predicament is much, much worse than so many sins. It's that we are born to live every second of our lives against the glory of the God of our lives. Every second. 
is that everything a person does as an unbeliever, from trafficking human beings to baking brownies to just breathing, is done securely from the heart against this infinitely good and awesome creator. I am, you are, we are, and there is no one else. Now, people don't always talk like that. But what sin and Satan whisper, their slaves do live out loud. No one tells me what to do. No one tells me what to believe. No one tells me how to live my life. No one judges me but me. And if I ever need saving, I am more than adequate myself for the task. I decide my destiny. I am. And there is no one else. And so to their everlasting shame, one gives nary a thought to the character and the attributes and the truth and the will and the word and the grace and the beauty and the glory of God. And still less do they give him glory as God. And in view of Christ and him crucified and raised for their salvation, which they reject, what could be more universally meriting of condemnation than that. Surely T.S. Eliot was right when he wrote that, quote, man is obstinate, blind, intent on self-destruction, passing from deception to deception, from grandeur to grandeur to final illusion lost in the wonder of his own greatness. Lost. You hear that? Lost in the wonder of his own greatness. Pride. The enemy of society, the enemy of himself. Close quote. But along these lines, friend, another is kind then to point out how from the first book of the Bible, to the last, the Bible beats down our pagan optimism and it opposes the central article of our pagan creed, which is this, I believe in man. Do you believe in man today? Do you believe in you? Another way to ask that is, are you rejecting the truth of God's saving gospel? Because if so, in all love, I just want to tell you, you will not survive what's coming upon the world of sinners from the Lord. All right. So much for this ungodly world in the Lord's certain words. Let's come now to this remnant of grace and the Lord's sanctifying remedies. Covering verses 1 to 3, a few other spots in the book. And actually, what I want you to do is see the, the word for there at the head of verse 4. You look at verse 4. It's for. What it's doing is it's setting off verses 1 to 3 from verses 4 to 15. So in effect, it's saying, if you would escape the judgment of God that's coming upon the world... And if you would then be distinct from those that will not survive it, if you are God's people in truth, you will be defined by these remedial actions of God in verses 1 to 3. God's true people gather together to seek the Lord till death do them part. But now... This is where we need to be reminded of what I said at the start. If God's directly addressing anybody in Zephaniah, isn't it Judah? Isn't it 
the people of God? Isn't it the city of God, quite possibly, in the midst of a reformation? So, so why is the word here not a present word of joy and celebration because of what God's doing? Why is it rather a warning of judgment? And the answer is sorrowful. The Reformation in Josiah's day will prove largely, if not only, skin deep. It will skirt around the heart. And it will leave their hearts unchanged. Right? Ceremonies might get changed. The order and object of worship might get righted. The people may begin again to traditionally attend to all the things. But in the end, in the end, they're going to walk away from the Lord and return again to the world of verses 4 to 15. They're going to abuse grace. They're going to reject the word of God for themselves. They're going to grieve the Holy Spirit. If they might, they're going to quench the Holy Spirit. Though called the people of God, though thought the people of God, though identifying perhaps even as the people of God, they're going to prove in the end to be indistinct from the world. Oh, dear ones. We continue to live in a day today of poor discipleship and biblical ignorance at best and all-out hypocrisy and apostasy at worst. There is a reason. If you go to 1 Peter chapter 4, there is a reason that judgment begins where? At the household of God. And it's because for all the people in the world, we should be God's people Really? It's a divine indictment that these remedies aren't just glad charges to the remnant of grace, but rather earnest charges to, as it says in verse 1, the shameless nation, this ungodly people of God, that the remnant of grace will inevitably work out for their own salvation. In other words, as needed, these actions here are not just Proofs of grace, but they're issues of repentance for the people at large. So, what are these remedial actions that serve to set God's people apart from the world? The first is in verse 1, where Zephaniah calls to God's people, what? Gather together, yes, gather. We are not to be a scattered people. We're not to be isolationists. We're not to believe ourselves independents. Individualist sheep are endangered ones. That's why the shepherds go after them. I'm talking about your Pete's coffee and your front porch on a lovely summer day with an open Bible sounds amazing. Just don't call it church. Don't call anything church that isn't what the Bible means by that word. There is no substitute. I want you to hear me now. There is no substitute according to the Bible for the gathering of the local church in your life as a follower of Jesus Christ. None. And because of this, the people of God do what they can, while they can, to gather together as often as they can as heirs of grace and mercy. You know, it's an interesting fact that the word here in verse 1 for gather actually refers to gathering stubble for the fire. We're not called to gather because we're all oaks of righteousness. Big and strong and sturdy. But because we're people who all used to be stubble that's been drawn out of the fire to become this grand, big word here, conflagration, 
right? This grand fire for the glory of Jesus Christ. We gather because, verse 2, we see this day coming, and were it not for the grace and mercy of God in our lives, that day would have consumed us also with the rest of the unbelieving world. And so we gather as we do like this because we are grateful to God in our hearts, but also because we need God from week to week, from day to day, from hour to hour. Our need for God is never past tense. It's never we needed God. It's always we need God. And by all biblical accounts, God has promised himself uniquely to the gathering of his people. And the most handy example is that of Thomas. Right? You think Thomas missed anything by being absent from the gathering of disciples that first Easter Sunday? If you don't know, Jesus showed up. And he missed it. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people after service. What do they say? That was exactly what I needed to hear. I'm struggling with this. I'm dealing with this. The Word of God met me right where I needed it. And how many times that we've actually fashioned uh, sermons here with people in mind, and you're thinking, man, this is going to be so great for them, and they don't show up. Would God call us to gather, beloved, if he didn't mean to gather with us to do us the very good that our souls most need? Church, to gather together is to avail ourselves of so many means that God has ordained to our spiritual health. So why wouldn't we do it as often as possible? It's just basic math. We've been working through Willy Wonka Charlie and the Chocolate Factory recently. Y'all know Veruca? Veruca Salt? She's a terrible little kid, right? Never mind that. Veruca had a better chance of finding a golden ticket than Charlie Bucket. Why? Because Charlie just kind of stumbled into two candy bars, and Veruca, with all of her wealth, had a factory working for her filled with candy bars. And so God, wanting us to avail ourselves of his mercies, much as we possibly can, causes people not once but twice in the verse for emphasis, gather together. Yes, gather. Give yourself more opportunities to be blessed by God. But now, when we gather, do we gather around anything centrally? That's the question. Well, that's verse 3. It says we gather to what? Seek the Lord. And all God's people said, well, duh. But you know, maybe that's how Judah got to where they were in Josiah's day. Maybe what started as this pure flame from heaven slowly flamed out as a familiarity with holy things. They were no longer spectacular. And they began to only breed contempt of God. And dear ones, we need to be watchful that we never gather in that kind of misdirection. In a most terrifying scene, in the Bible, Jesus gives this scenario in Matthew chapter 7 of so many people coming to him at the last day, calling him Lord, and giving all these reasons for why they should be part of the heavenly gathering. And so they say things like this. They say, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? But you know what they don't say? Did we not seek you, Lord? They were all around him. But it was never him 
that they sought. Because you see, in and above all else, that's what God's true people do. We stay enamored with knowing Christ and being known by Christ. Oh Lord, here I am in all of me. <laughs> oh, here I am. You know me. Please help me to know you. Please make me hungry for you. Please make me thirsty for you. Please fill me up with you. You pray in that? I've said it once. I've said it a hundred times. A church can do no better for her people. Shepherds can do no better for Christ's sheep than giving them the truest, richest, deepest, loveliest portrayal that they can of Jesus Christ week after week after week after week until they go to see him face to face. So why have you gathered here this morning? Maybe you don't know. You're just like, I don't know. <laughs> and maybe you know exactly. But it's not exactly to seek the Lord. It's to see a friend. It's to show yourself. It's to perform some task. It's to check a box. Maybe it's for intellectual stimulation. It's to satisfy the person who invited you to come. Just couldn't tell them no. So here you are. It's because you're lost, perhaps. And the world is out of answers. And you don't know where to go, so you're here. It's because you grew up in the South. And isn't this what all true Southerners do? Why have you gathered with us today? The people of God gather to gather with God. We gather to hold fellowship with God. We gather to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. We gather to seek the Lord. And as we do, we gather to be changed at heart by the Lord who promises to meet us. Those in Matthew 7 may have done much in Jesus' name, but you know, again, what they did not do? Just the very things that mark those who are truly united to Jesus. Go look at it and you'll find they did not obey the word of God. That's the accusation Jesus makes. They didn't do what God said. They might have put on religion, but they did not put on righteousness. They didn't put on regeneration. Those are different things. They weren't obedient to the word of God from the heart. And that's why after exhorting us to seek the Lord, Zephaniah then continues, most importantly, when you gather here, when you gather together, seek humility. Humility. Because that's the only way to know the Lord that we seek. If pride in our passage says, I am and there is no one else, humility says, God is. And I will listen to him above all else. Zephaniah is exhorting Judah to have a heart like their king, Josiah. And that's a goal for our gatherings as well, except way greater. It's to have a collective heart that's growing to be like our King, Jesus. It will be hard not to see the Lord in a people who are seeking the Lord, truly. So again, why have you gathered together with us today? Is it to have Christ formed within you? 
Is it to receive the Word of God however kindly it crosses us? I fear there are many gatherings that have given up the ghost in this respect. There's even a kind of gospel ecumenicism that will tell you, leave the Bible at the door. It will deafen the heart to all God says in His Word, all of it. You know the Bible's more than just like John or Romans. There's a kind of gospel ecumenicism. You start talking biblical ministry. They're like, get that out of here. You start talking healthy ecclesiology, doctrine of the church, get it out. That's going to divide us. You start talking holistic doctrinal fidelity. You start talking whole canon exposition of biblical texts and the depth of discipleship that is vital to Philippians 1.27. It says, only let your manner of life be worthy, weighty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Get it out. I don't want to hear about it. We have a unity to keep. That is not humility. That is pride. Faking like humility. And we are urged here to be watchful right there. We're exhorted to gather together to seek the Lord and walk humbly with Him. If I can add on one more thing is to stay the course in that. It's not without merit. An old Puritan, he once uh, exalted endurance as the chief of all graces. Why? Because it's finally endurance that will prove all gracing you to be true. What was the denouncement of Judah that God gave? You heard it from George a week ago. Chapter 1, verse 6. What was the denouncement there? Chapter 1, verse 6. Wasn't it this? That having started out, they had then turned... What does it say? You can look at your Bibles. Okay? They turned back from following the Lord as those who do not seek the Lord or inquire of Him. We need to be able to hear that and then be under no illusion that faithfulness is going to be an easy thing. That a godless world will let us be this grand conflagration for God without taunting and reviling and hating and giving trials of various kinds. Or that you and I are so well rooted in Christ, so warmed to Jesus that our love could What have we seen in Zephaniah so far? Two chapters. If not a people of God who have lost touch with the love of God, who have taken on the loves of the world and turned back from the narrow way that leads to life. And what have we seen? If not a remnant of grace a people holding on for dear life who for it are smugly hated and taunted by the world. To relativize such a gathering as this is to be out of touch with what it will take, what God has given us to make it all the way home faithful. That's why the writer of Hebrews exhorts us in chapter 10. Let us consider to stir up, how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to what? 
meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more, as you see the day drawing near, as Zephaniah, one thing you won't hear then on that day that you hear a lot of today, church. What a waste of time. Didn't really need it. Could have done without it. This gathering of God's people. I don't think so. If we'd keep in step with our Lord, if we'd be meet to meet Him face to face, we'd best stay gathering with those who humbly seek Him now. That's how we reflect His radiance to a world that is darkened by sin. And so back to the matter of gathering stubble. Friend, if you're unbelieving, you're here this morning and you're unbelieving, the Bible understands you to be one that needs to be plucked out of the fire and gathered to Christ among the people of God. As you sit right now, a sinner without excuse or escape, you will not survive the day of the Lord. The risen Christ will be awesome, as it says in the text. He will be awesome. These are the worst words ever against you. And you will receive the penalty of your sins, sins that might otherwise have been forgiven. This is what I mean. God sent Christ into this world to save sinners. Though he was God, he humbled himself. He was born a man and servant to man. He obeyed God through all of our taunting to death on a cross. And there, though we continued on with our boasting, he continued on with his bearing of our sin and the curse of God that was against us. And he did that until he could say, it is finished. So that if you would, if you would this morning, you may be joined to Christ, forgiven your sins, reconciled to God and to his people forevermore. So repent and trust in Jesus while you can. Beloved, I lament that the world goes on in its course in large part because it sees no better world in you and me. One of the main ways God gathers his stubble is through the gathering of folks like this who from the least of us to the greatest of us bear the heart of our king, Jesus. I wish you'd be a foretaste of heaven. We really should be. And to that end, we have our marching orders this morning. Stay gathering to humbly seek the Lord together. It may not sound very revolutionary, but I'll tell you what it will do. It will stabilize a reformation in the church in a way that greatly impacts the world for Christ and brings about so much joy forevermore in him. Let's pray together. Well, Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask now that even as we've closed a sermon that the influence of the Holy Spirit would not close there, but that you would continue, Lord, to work in our hearts and to help us feel and relate and be changed by the truth of the word of Christ. Make us a people for your own glory more and more. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.